Okay, thanks so much. Um, happy to be here. Welcome to, to Harvard. Uh, welcome to CID. Um, I am about, I'm going to give a talk on social networks, and I have a really hard time, you know, keeping my slides condensed. So I'd love to just interrupt me throughout, um, and uh, uh, I think it'll just flow better that way. Than I try to reserve time at the end. Okay. So what I want to do today is I want to give you a bit of a perspective on the things I've been thinking about recently, uh, both applications and also methods for thinking about social networks in, in developing country contexts. And I hope to show you some of the breadth of, of um, how these tools, like, of applications that these tools are suited for. And also, um, I, I also want to make sure to talk about um, where this field, this empirical field has come in terms of measurement and maybe you know, lowering the cost of entry because of the first iteration of this work required very, very expensive surveys um, that you know, limit the, 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 the ability to, to ask these kinds of questions. Okay. So I'm going to start with um, an example from my own recent work that's very similar to, I think, the, the best literature, or the, the kind of most um, expansive literature in development on, um, on social networks. Um, so many papers out there try to think about how to spread information through a So, and, and usually the, the paradigm goes the following way. We don't have that many people that we can initially inform. It's costly, we have to teach them something. And then we want the, the community to do the rest of the work. Um, and so the, the, the early literature has, has kind of asked if we want the greatest possible take up, if we want the most people to hear this message that the policy makers trying to uh, disseminate, who should we inform? Um, and so, uh, Energy at all in their science paper, the diffusion of microfinance talks about this. Benicia at all and thinking about complex contagion thinks about this, and also some work by Oriana Bandera co authors. And typically, you want to inform somebody who has a big microphone, right? A lot of friends who has a lot of uh, who, who, when they speak, a lot of people end up hearing. Now, um, these are really cool papers, they are a nice proof of concept for um, you know, networks mattering, but the, the data demands are really high. And the first paper I'm going to show you actually, you know. Has, has, uses some of this kind of expensive uh, costly data. But typically, what the, the, these early studies are going to do is collect full network data. So that means you do some sort of census, you ask everybody about all of their network relationships, you then have this tedious process of matching. You know, somebody says Lakshmi, which Lakshmi in the village is it? Um, and, and all of this, you know, takes a lot of, a lot of effort. Um, and you need very high sampling rates for, for inferences to, to work well in some cases. As my um, collaborator, Arunta Shaker, has said that. Okay, so the first paper that I'm going to talk about of, of mine kind of fits into this mold, um, but with a, you think with a small twist. Um, and so this is a, this is a joint work with um, Eliana LaFerrara, who uh, is now the CID as well. We're thrilled to have her. Um, Eric Baumgartner, Victor Orozco, and Pedro. So what we're going to do in, in this project is we're going to study um, a peer sexual health counseling program offered in Brazilian high school. What they're trying to do is improve information about contraception. So that's true about, you know, like that, that's a, a similar feature with other studies out there. But they're also trying to change norms, right? To get people to adopt contraception use and to change their, their views towards sexual health, that actually requires not just information, but also norm change. Um, and what they decided would be the, the, the best in this situation wasn't to do something top down, because the teachers aren't really going to be the best source of that norm change, but rather the program engages peer volunteers from the, the uh, chosen from most high school students. These are, are called globalized ones. So our research questions uh, first is, is an impact evaluation. Does this program have impacts on the outcomes of interest? Do people learn about contraception use? Do Use more. Okay. Use more. Um, oops, thank you. That would be helpful. Great. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, does, does this program have any impact at all? And um, I think more interestingly, from a network's perspective, does it matter how the mobilizers are, are selected? Okay. So, um, just in terms of background for context, this is a place where you know, these types of interventions could play an important role. Um, at baseline, among the 16-year-olds in the study, 49% um, of students are sexually active. 
Uh, but contraception use is pretty intermittent. It's nowhere near universal. 23% uh, say they didn't use uh, contraception during their last sexual encounter. 42% um, say they're unlikely to use it in the heat of the moment, and 70% perceive it to be burdensome in some kind of way. Moreover, there are gaps in knowledge. 23%, um, only 23% uh, report knowing how to use a condom correctly. 29% don't know that a woman's uh, fertility varies over the month, and only 19% can correctly identify their fertile period. So there's plenty of room for improvement in this type of population. Um, and moreover, teen pregnancy is quite high. At N-Line in the control group, about 10% of girls had been, had been pregnant. Moreover, talking about sex is relatively uncommon. So this is another situation where, you know, the, the, the stand, our standard thoughts about what diffuses through a network might be different if people aren't really talking about it that much. 60% um, of respondents discuss sexual health topics with only zero or one person in our N-Line control. Okay. So what we're going to do is, is, is um, go into 134 high schools in Salvador Bahia in Brazil. 88 of them are treated with this overall intervention and randomize the intervention and randomize how this intervention, how the, these mobilizers, how these peer educators are selected from within these high school communities. So in each treated school, six peer educators, they meet weekly to be trained um, and then to discuss um, uh, pregnancy, sexual reproductive health, life aspirations. So they're meeting with college students to design this kind of to, to learn themselves, and then they design their own school-wide activities. And this can really uh, range from lots of different things. So they might hold, they might do uh, plays, they might put up banners, they might have um, class-level discussions, they might you know, teach people, um, but these things are all done outside of the traditional classroom and, and teacher interactions. Okay. So when we're trying to think conceptually about what kinds of features might uh, lead to better mobilizers, so they need to exert effort. Um, we need to think about you know, the fact that sexual health topics are sensitive in nature. People aren't really talking about them all that much. Uh, information needs to reach the population with the greatest need. Um, and in secondary school, we, need to, we, we think this is a, a place where norms, social signaling, and status are all going to be really important. And so if it's viewed that um, talking about this stuff or uh, encouraging uh, contraception use is going to be viewed as uncool, then that could just put a damper on how well the, the program works. Okay, so then we randomize across three different selection strategies in a control group. Um, so the first is kind of our benchmark. This is uh, allowing the school administration to pick who these six people should be. Uh, this is the way a lot of these types of things are done, just from a top-down perspective. Um, the second is to look and see if the centrality results that we see for agriculture apply in this context where you need to both learn, but also you want the norms to, to change. Um, and then we also ask, well, given that norms seem to be pretty important, is there a role for popularity kind of independent of centrality to play a role where the most popular students, although they might not lead to the greatest diffusion, they might have the greatest you know, ability to, to shape the discussion. And there's been some work around bullying that suggests that that social reference or popular students might actually be most effective in those types of contexts. So here we need both of these things to happen at the same time. We need to have the information flow, but we have to have people kind of buy in that this is something that everybody should embrace. Yeah. How correlated are the number two and number three? They're quite correlated, absolutely. And that's why, and, and what I'm just going to show you in this brief snapshot today, we're not going to you know, be able to, to say much overall, um, and we use a model to try to, to, to further parse it. So they're, they're quite correlated, but not entirely. I think it's like half are, are kind of um, a high propensity to be both. Uh, but yes, the popular students are more central and the more central students are more popular, but it's still not 100% the same. Yeah. So just to be clear, when you say the school selects, when you say the nurse, you know that for a fact or yours? No. This is a bad, this is a bad name. Um, <laughs> we're, we're still working on the title. Uh, so the school, this is the thing that, this is of the three treatments we have the least insight into. Um, it seems that this, when, to the extent we know what they're doing, they're picking more girls. Um, they're picking people with better Portuguese grades, but also looks like they're picking people as what well. they're picking a mix. And some of them might be people they think are actually more at risk. So, um, it, but this is actually quite distinct from two. From the school's yeah. picking quite differently. Yeah. Uh, and they think that girls are the ones uh, on average who should be 
Uh, and these get more of a mix of 50-50 uh, uh, gender split. <clears throat> okay, so the network data. So this is one example where we did collect the kind of complex, complete network data. Not, not complete, but you know, we tried to, to do as, as much as we could um, at, at baseline. So we asked about best friends um, and people with whom they talked about sex. And we also asked about the most popular people. They were given a tablet and they could then like scroll through all the pictures of the people in their cohort um, and, and, and highlight them. So, so we had the, the technology do that matching process for us. Um, the network data was then used to select the central and the proximate mobilizers. We gave the school the list of the top 20 most central people. And then they went down the list until they got six people to accept. Um, and then we did the same thing with popularity. We gave the school the list of the 20 most popular kids and they went down the list until they got about six to accept. And so we have these counterfactual lists in all of the treatments, um, which is helpful for trying to disentangle these features. Okay, first stage outcomes, this is any treatment. Um, this is really just the basic, did you, uh, did you have exposure to the intervention? So this is pooling all of the treatments versus control. The first one is, do you know about this pamphlet that the, health, the public health authority is distributing that the mobilizers tended to use in some of their activities? So this goes up um, from 17% in the control group by five percentage points. Uh, columns three and four, did you receive any sort of sexual health counseling broadly construed in the school? That goes up by six percentage points with treatment. And the number of friends people are actually talking about a sex with goes up by uh, eight percentage points, oh, 8.08. <clears throat> now, if we look at this by um, treatment, it turns out that in terms of those first two first stage outcomes, doing any kind of network targeting just really seems to... Um, to juice up the, the results. Um, and especially with uh, uh, columns three and four, we can, we can reject that um, network targeting and school picking are, are doing equally. Okay. But that's just for information flow. Maybe that shouldn't be so surprising. We know from all of these other, um, these other studies that yeah, if you tell more central people, the popular people happen to also be a bit more central, then more people will hear. So what about actual behavior? Well, we find that on average, if you got any of the treatments, um, pregnancy rates fall from a, um, a, a base of 7% in the control by about 14%. And also the likelihood of using contraception goes up. And again, these results are stronger for the network targeting. We have the most power on T2, the, the scaly measure, but we can never um, in these separate uh, T2 from T3. So it seems like the school is doing particularly badly and there's you know, lots of benefit to being able to go uh, target a little bit uh, based on the network. Yeah. So this is on the extensive margin, right? That you receive treatment, but given that your, uh, the mobilizers could also have been differently ranked, uh, like in one school it would have been one, two, three, in the other it would have been like 10, 11, 12. Did you also want something on the intensive margins? Yeah, so we haven't done that. What we've done kind of on the intensive margin, which I don't have time to show you, um, is we've tried to estimate a network model based on the network locations of the mobilizers in your treatment and the mobilizers in the counterfactual treatments, how intensively you would have heard the messaging. And so what we're finding there is that that's giving us a bit more traction on separating these popularity and information flow. If you're close, if you're hearing more messages originating from mobilizers, you're, do, you're, you're more likely to have those first stage outcomes pop up. But um, what seems to matter for behavior change is that the, um, the messages floating around the school are those that are kind of originating from the popular people, which is more consistent with like translating the information into action requires kind of that norm change and the popular people are, are particularly useful at doing that. So one interesting kind of question about all of these um, network targeting things is, well, okay, great, this seems a little bit um, theoretical. How would we actually do this in practice? Um, well, you know, uh, Banerjee et al. have shown that it's actually not so hard to elicit uh, centrality through easy survey measures. People actually do have a good sense for who's central and who's popular as two separate dimensions. Popularity is easy to measure. So, you know, um, the idea that you could do this kind of screening without requiring those those, those network maps uh, for policy, I think is, is, uh, is quite reasonable. Okay. 
anything else about this? Yeah. So this networking you were saying with the in-person or it also includes your networking through other, because nowadays networking also happens with WhatsApp. Yeah, so this is about people in your school who, you're, who are your best friends, and that's how we're defining a link. I think this is, a, this is kind of a more philosophical question, though. For any of these studies, we have to take a stand on what even we mean by a link. And so usually what we're going to say in, when we do this in a village setting or you know, information, risk sharing, socialization. But for, other, for some applications, you might have a view that the social network, the, those kind of, you know, um, the, the weak ties might actually matter a lot. And so I do think that this is a crucial design element when you're doing social network data. What do we actually mean by a link and what do we think is the right, is the right measure? Um, and so, so I think um, lots of people have thought about social media in, in the US. We're, we're thinking about you know, much tighter knit uh, units like the school where we think the norms operate and the villages where we think that local information is flowing and that restoring is happening. But it's a, important consideration yeah um one hypothesis might be that the popular people are just super confident and so they're more willing to say stuff about these kind of slightly taboo topics is that plausible in your context um, do you have any data on that so we can look at um how active they were and how many of these different uh dramas they put on and actually across the treatments the the, the those things are pretty balanced um, and especially on those other kinds of observables between the t2 and t3 people uh, there aren't very big differences. So it doesn't seem like the, the effort margin is what was doing it. Um, and, and the fact that we're getting traction on the network model also suggests that there is something there with how, how the, this message is spreading. Yeah. What do we know about the uh, people that the school was picking in terms of network position? Were the people in the periphery mostly? Yeah, they're definitely not as central <coughs> um, as, as what you get here. Uh, so they're, they're targeting, they seem to be potentially targeting on part conscientiousness, I think hence more leaning toward more women, but also thinking that, oh, the women who are at risk for pregnancy, maybe that's the audience we need to find. And that's not going to do as much to kind of change the overall norms toward, toward these things. Okay. So I'm going to now uh, think about two very different applications uh, rather than asking how networks spread information, I'm gonna ask how networks change with respect to policy change. And that then can have downstream impacts on all of these other functions of the network, such as risk sharing or information flow. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is financial markets. And then the second is some, I'm gonna talk about affirmative action type policies. Okay, so the, in terms of finance, just to kind of set the, the, the stage, we know that in a lot of developing countries, there's a vibrant informal market for loans. There are money lenders, people are borrowing from family and friends, they're embedded in risk sharing networks, there's trade credit among firms. And so, you know, a lot of policy is kind of thought through um, as if, you know, the absence of formal credit means the absence of any credit whatsoever. But clearly we know that that's, that's naive. And um, the question we're trying to ask is when formal credit enters, what does that do to these existing informal relationships and, and sort of more broadly, what is that doing to social ties uh, in, in the communities where it's entering? And this is going to be important because the, the financial inclusion policy is often enacted through subsidies and preferential lending. And so thinking about all of these issues holistically might lead to different answers for how we design these subsidy policies. Okay. This is work with uh, Abhiji Banerjee, uh, Arun Tudrashek, Rasudu Flo, Cynthia Kennan, and, and Matt Jackson. Um, and here, we're going to combine data from two experiments. One is the setting of the diffusion of microfinance, which is that original natural experiment that showed that network position matters and getting the word out about microfinance. Um, and this is where there's really, really excellent data um, that was painstakingly collected. There's 13 dimensions of relationships collected in 75 villages. This was done in two different waves. Um, and so there's a panel of network information. Uh, um, and this, we're gonna use the fact that in 43 of these villages, of the 75 villages where this, this really lovely network data was collected, um, a microfinance institution entered for the first time. So uh, because it's a panel of network data, we can then ask, well, how does the network change in the places that received microcredit versus those that didn't, although it's not random. 
We're then going to be able to uh, use uh, information from an RCT to kind of show that those, those results also come through. So our research question is, how does the, net, how does the network change because of microfinance? Are there GE e impacts? And what do we mean by that? Well, are people who themselves don't really, uh, who, who themselves you know, don't have any interest or, or aren't eligible for microcredit, are they affected along the way? You know, maybe we shouldn't care so much if people are, are optimizing, now I can do informal or formal, but we might care, you know, it, it, it's kind of uh, striking if those who themselves aren't using microcredit are nonetheless um, affected through, through the entry of formal finance. So the first pass, we're gonna use this diff and diff with the panel of full network data. So the, the first thing we can look at, so columns one through three, this is just the density is just yeah, um, the degree over the, sample, the, the, the network size. So it's basically the percent of other households one is connected to. And um, in microfinance times post, this declines. So it seems that microfinance is associated with this shedding of links. But as I said, we're interested in understanding more than that. What is the pattern of spillovers? Which people are affected? Um, should we be alarmed by this or not? Uh, and so what we're going to do is use um, machine learning, use a random forest model to predict uh, in the treatment group the characteristics of people who adopt when microfinance enters. We use that, and these are all based on baseline uh, uh, covariates that we observe in the treatment and the control villages. So we can then calculate, even for people in the untreated places, who is a high versus a low adopter of microfinance. And then we can ask, since we have this very rich network data, how do these different kinds of links change? So looking at the people who have a link ex ante, if they're both affected by microfinance, they're HH, how does their link chain? And if neither one of those two people in that link is affected, are they affected at all by the entry of other people you know, doing microfinance? In their okay. So what do we find? We find that links fall quite a lot for these LL pairs. What does that mean? So you take two people who were friends before and who themselves had no interest or ability to borrow from microcredit, microcredit enters, they're, they're shedding links as well. And in fact, in the Karnataka case, the link shedding is the greatest for those LL households. So there seems to be a spillover onto them. Now, one thing that could be happening is, well, maybe those two LL people, the people who aren't really that interested in microcredit, they're friends with somebody who is interested in microcredit. And so when that friend is treated, she breaks links with both of them, and then it's no longer useful for the three of them to be, to, for any of them to be friends. Well, what do we do? We can look at LLL triples, and we can keep kicking this up to bigger and bigger. Um, we could, in theory, keep kicking this up to bigger and bigger constellations of people. And what do we find? Again, the first row for the LLL triples, so the three people who were friends at baseline, none of whom care about microcredit, even they're losing links. Um, when microfinance enters. So this speaks to some sort of global externality that's spilling over onto these people who aren't themselves or, um, you know, borrowing from, from microcredit institutions. So the paper, one part of the paper um, is to build a model trying to think about where this global externality comes from. And just in case you're curious, um, the, this model has people paying an effort cost to go to the town square to form and maintain links. Now, when I, when I real, and, and so um, uh, what might happen? Well, the high, the, the, the people who are borrowing from microcredit, they might say, well, you know, it's not as important for me to go socialize in the town, town square. I can get my risk sharing through formal credit. But the people, some of the people, these L people might go to the town square because those high people are there. So when the high people are no longer showing up, they might decide, well, it's not worth it for me to show up either. And that means that they don't meet the high people, but they also don't meet the low people as well. And so this kind of a global externality can, can um, give these types of relationships. Okay. So um, the, when kind of presenting just the Karnataka evidence, there were a few pushbacks. First, well, this is a diff and diff. It's not an RCT. So what should we make of that? And second, the only outcome variables I'm showing you so far are just network variables. How should we think about that mattering for other real outcomes that uh, downstream? Okay, so then what did we do? Well, we brought in RCT data from Hyderabad, and I think, um, and, and there are sort of two things there. 
So one, we have the RCT, microfinance had randomly entered some neighborhoods and not others. Um, there's a rich set of outcome variables, but this is a place where we don't have that really beautiful rich network data. We didn't collect two waves of it. We didn't collect data with 13 types of dimensions of relationship. But what we had done is collected partial information just at, at the second end, the third end line. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, because we were only sampling a subset of the neighborhoods, their dense urban areas, we weren't able, even if we had wanted to, to kind of do that full network. And so what we use is a method that Arun and I developed with uh, uh, Tyler McCormick at University of Washington to try to bring, uh, to try to kind of, you know, fill in the information we don't observe when we can only talk to a subset of people uh, using what's called aggregated relational data. And I'll talk about this just a little bit to show you how it worked in this setting. And we've been trying to expand on the tools um, that can use aggregated relational data to try to even lower the cost further of collecting this kind of information in your own surveys. Okay, so what's an example? One example uh, is think of or list all of your friends in this village. So, you know, who are they? Okay, you tell me 10 people. Now, of these 10 people, how many of them own a tractor? And I'm going to do this for many different kinds of traits. How many of these people on your friend list uh, have somebody who is a government employee? Uh, how many of them have a migrant? How many of them have somebody in the household who studied past 10th standards? Things like this. And these are, are, are going to help us kind of triangulate the, the dimensions of linking across people in villages. And I'll be a little bit more specific in a second. <clears throat> So in this other, so I'm going to move into this other more methodological paper. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be pretty hand wavy, but I just want to kind of throw out there that this is, this is a method that's out there to use. You can download our codes. I'm happy to also help you think about whether it's a good fit for your own empirical setting. Um, and so what, we, what, what you do, uh, at least if you're trying to um, estimate those kinds of pairwise links like we wanted to do in the microfinance study is something like the following. Okay, so what we do first is we collect people's information on their number of friends. So as I said, you know, I'll think, I'll introspect, you tell me what you mean by a friend, I'll tell you, yes, I have 10 friends. And then uh, I'm gonna collect those kinds of ARD questions for all of those 10 friends. And one nice way to do it is just to say, go friend by friend and ask them, does this person have a tractor? Does this person have um, a government employee? What's their caste? What's their religion, et cetera. That gives you these ARD counts. So these YIKs are just the number of people in your friend group uh, uh, who happen to have these, these traits. Um, you need to collect the actual trait representation in the community. You need to know what is the truth, uh, how many, what, what real fraction in the village has the tractor and how many people there are. Then, what, if you specify a network formation model, ARD actually is pretty, um, uh, is pretty rich and can, in many different cases, identify the parameters of that model. And that can then be used to estimate the network traits that you can't observe through a direct elicitation. So in, in the first iteration of this, we're going to think about a specific network formation model that relies on a latent surface. Now, this is a little bit um, impenetrable sometimes, so I'm going to try. So but please, please ask for clarification. Please. Yeah. We go there. So in these trait identifications, is there some like the intuition would be you want to have highly connected and unconnected people. And so do you want to have traits which are rare and traits which are like, is there a minimal set of spanning the space of traits which gives you the maximal information on connectivity? Or? Yeah. So if they're too common, then everybody has it. If they're too rare, you're never going to see it. So you kind of need the, the sweet spot. And so you know, you can do a lot of this with like three or four traits. We typically collect eight just in case some of them aren't that helpful. And what we what you want what you want these traits to do is actually kind of align with how you think socialization works. So we think about you know picking things that look like caste or ethnicity, things that look like wealth, maybe the intersection of those, and then other things in the village. You know, maybe um, geography, maybe that matters. Are you in this part of the village or that part of the village? Um, uh, and so I think. Um, uh, trying to figure, trying to, you know, with your qualitative work, figuring out what are the relevant axes of interaction and then trying to capture those in these questions. But do you, don't you also want very rare and very common to identify like, you know, super socially connected people and super introverts or something? Like, 
should I think of this like IRD where I want sort of easy and hard kind of styles of traits or, or is it better to always have like a, a, a medium present trait? I guess my intuition is that if it's too rare, um, you're not gonna actually sample that person or, um, you know, a lot of this argument's gonna rely on averaging across people. So if there's really only one person with that trait, then you actually wanna say, are you connected to so-and-so? Are you connected to us? And that's actually the trait. Um, uh, are you connected to the government office in, in, in some way? Um, so I think, I think you might wanna just go for it directly if it's something super, super rare. Okay, so the model we're going to use, and 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 you know, you we've shown in more sub in more recent work, and I'll try to go through one more example that uh, you can sub in a lot of different kinds of network formation models, and and some of them are greedy from a data perspective, and some of them aren't. This one is somewhat greedy, so we're going to think about these people kind of living on some latent space that we can't observe, um, and uh, the traits that people possess, these ARD traits, are going to be correlated with those locations. And this latent space is going to govern the likelihood that any two nodes are linked. So our linking, our, our, our network model is just this, the, the, the crux of it is this uh, probability. So the probability that nodes i and j are linked, conditional on the parameters, is going to be a, a function of, an, of fixed effects for each person. How gregarious are they? Some people just have a lot more friends than others. And then the last term, the zeta zivj, this is a term that thinks about the distance between these two groups on the latent space. So this is a way to think about, um, you know, modulating uh, uh, the, the friendship probabilities with the, the, these distances. So if the, um, you know, ethnic group A and the ethnic group B traits are located very far apart, on this latent space, then the probability that those two people, are, those two groups are going to interact is low. Um, and so this is actually the specific questions we asked in one of the neighborhoods of Hyderabad and, and the latent space. So we asked about um, things that aren't necessarily viewed as, uh, that are viewed as a little bit taboo. So arrests and remarriages. Turns out that those groups are clustered close together. So the likelihood of people, so the, what this is telling us is that people who know families who've remarried are, are also likely to also know people who've uh, been arrested. Uh, and then you know, the, the bottom center is picking up something that looks kind of correlated with wealth. So government employees and people who have a migrant who, who lives abroad, those, those are highly correlated. Um, and then twins and polygamy are, are correlated as well. You just have more draws, I guess, of in your household uh, of opportunities to have twins. Turns out twins isn't a good example, really, um, because it's random. You want something that's not random, and in some sense, that's just picking up the number of women in your house. Okay. So this allows us, this framework, asking just these ARD questions, allows us to triangulate these positions on the network, on the latent space, that allows us to estimate the parameters of that formation model, and that'll give us estimates of arbitrary pairwise link rates between any two people in that network. And that's exactly what we need to answer the questions we started with in the microfinance example. Okay, so this is the same result, but with the microfinance RCT. And the first row is saying those LL households in the, place, uh, in the places where now microfinance is entered versus not, again, they lose links. Um, and so that, that result from the, the, the rural natural experiment uh, shows up in the urban experiment where we're using this um, network estimation rather than having that really rich full network data. Itself. This then allows us to say, well, are there any kind of downstream impacts? Why should we care? Well, one, one related question is um, if, if people are opting out of the network, especially when they get access to formal credit, does this mean that those people who themselves aren't borrowing from microcredit aren't able to smooth consumption as much? And so we can run something that looks like a Townsend regression where we ask how correlated is my own income with my consumption? And the prediction would be if um, my ability to smooth consumption by going to my network is falling when I lose social ties and I'm not given microfinance to make up for it, then I should see that correlation increase for those LL, for the L households, just the L households. Um, and that's what we see in the second row, that uh, both for total expenditures and non-food expenditures, the low, uh, the low likelihood households, when microfinance enters, 
experience an increased correlation between income and consumption, which suggests that they're smoothing consumption less well. And there are other reasons why this might happen, but one potential reason is that that risk sharing gets crowded out when they lose those, those network wins. Okay, so the final empirical example I wanna talk about is a different, uh, a different kind of policy that's moving network structure. And this is joint work with um, Samit Arajula, Arun Chandrasekhar, and MR Sharan. So this here, we're gonna to try to think about affirmative action type policy. So very, very different kind of policy than finance. Um, and what are affirmative action policies trying to do at the end of the day? They're trying to combat inequality and often uh, inequality experienced by historically disadvantaged groups. So what we're gonna do is we're going to look at political reservation, which has been very well studied um, in India for scheduled caste communities and ask, when affirmative action comes to town, does that, uh, does that lead to social network change? Well, we know that resources change in response to affirmative action. So if resources are shifting, that might mean that there are incentives to shift your network links. Why would we care about that? Well, as in the previous example, networks are facilitating social learning, they're facilitating the sharing, et cetera. So upsetting those networks um, could be great, uh, or it could actually uh, lead to some, some negative externalities. So our question here is gonna be, does this reservation policy change the social connections? And does that matter for downstream outcomes? And the one we're powered to, to talk about, we have data on is information flow. Okay, so a priori, this was a kind of a, 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 I guess both papers are sort of, you know, it could go either way. So in some sense, they're descriptive papers, just trying to estimate the magnitude, which, which of these different um, stories dominates and does it matter in a, a magnitude plus. So in the, in the kind of one hand, what is, um, what is this reservation policy do? Well, by make, well, it, what it, so let me just back up. What is it? So it, it says that for these local um, government elections, let's think of a group of five villages, only people of the disadvantaged group can stand for election in certain election cycles. So that means you're giving power to this disadvantaged group that in the status quo would never have access to, to power. Okay. So what is this gonna do to, 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 to incentives to link? Well, it might be valuable to link to those with information about government programs, right? If you, if you hear that, it, you know, just to not be left out in the cold, maybe somebody has to sign a form for you. Um, you know, there, there are lots of reasons why getting, being close to power is gonna be helpful in turning on the spigot to government, to government benefits. Without reservation, SC households don't have a direct line to power. So they need to invest in links, potentially, with those in power to be able to you know, not be left out in the cold. Um, so if those links are costly to maintain, reservation decreases the incentives for the SCs to keep those links up. They have a direct line to power now. The person in their own community for whom those links are less costly can tell you the information. And so you might see um, decreases in links between SCs and non-SCs. There could also be a whole set of stories operating through perceptions, beliefs, and norms. And there, this could go different ways as well. Um, the literature suggests that some of the affirmative action type policies, uh, especially with regards to women, um, might lead to changes in your beliefs of, of, of capability, et cetera. Uh, and that might mean that that person's more attractive to link to, or you've learned something about that group. Um, and so maybe exposure would increase uh, links. On the flip side, these are contentious policies and it could trigger animus or backlash and the, the, the advantage group might resent the disadvantaged group. Um, or there could be amplification effects if this channel's at play. The, I, I no longer am interacting cross group and then because of that, the norms seem to, to get worse. So this really could go any number of directions. Um, but we do think that the, 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 the first one is potentially likely and also more likely in a context of let's say caste-based reservation than gender-based reservation, um, just in terms of you know, the uh, interacting uh, cross versus within household. Okay. So um, what we're gonna do is follow Kumar and Sharan. So Chinmaya and Amar Sharan have a very nice RD uh, paper trying to think about the benefits of reservation, both in terms of public and private goods. Um, and so they've identified 
that Bihar really followed the um, allocation algorithm to a T. You can match exactly which places were and weren't reserved following um, a running variable that gives us a nice RD strategy. Um, and we're going to do that. So then we conduct surveys around the cutoff and we collect partial network data again. Um, and uh, we're going to do something that uh, with the Armstrong and Colistar method for, for, for implementing RD. Okay, so this is just to show that the first stage is basically 100%. It's basically a, a sharp RD. Um, the running variable is the SC population of the Gram Panchayat, recentered so that the last one reserved and the first one unreserved, the midpoint is zero. Um, and we sampled both the last one in and the first one out in every block. So mechanically, we don't have any imbalance. Okay, now what did we do with networks? Well, we collected exactly what I had said before. We're, we're asked about three layers, socialization, advice, and borrowing. Um, and uh, we asked, give us the list of these people. And for each person, tell us a bunch of ARD traits and tell us their cast. And what we really care about are, you know, within versus cross cast uh, relationships. But the fact that we ask these, these ARD questions also allows us to construct village level network statistics to see if overall patterns at the more macro level have shifted as well. Okay, so this is really our main result um, and there's a lot going on. So I'm gonna try to go a little bit slowly through this. What's our outcome variable? Our outcome variable is the link rate from the perspective of the respondent. So this is the degree normalized by the population size times 100. And the in, in interpretation of that is this is the, the fraction of people in the community that I'm linked to. Now we're gonna do this in kind of the, the SC to SC, SC to non-SC, non-SC to non-SC ways in the following sense. The top panel are the link rates to non-SCs. The bottom panel are the link rates to SCs. The first column is everybody. The second column is SC respondents and the third column is non-SC respondents. So the one that we, the, the two that we care about, if we're gonna think about that, um, you know, value of information kind of story is this one. How do SC links to non-SCs change? And then also this one, how do SC links to other SCs change? So if now I have incentives if, if I have weaker incentives to maintain those costly links with the dominant group, I might break them and then redouble my efforts with my own community. And that's what we find. Um, we find that uh, there's a smaller effect. Um, you should look at the, com the confidence intervals rather than the, the standard errors, that the non-SCs say they're linking less to the SCs, though it's, it's, it's not quite as, as pronounced. And there's no effect between the non-SCs and the non-SCs. So overall, very big shifts in the network. Yeah. Professor, but, uh, so within SCs also, there's a lot of heterogeneity and usually yeah. reservations lead to a scenario where the dominant SCs occupy power. Yes. Uh, in your survey, were you able to disentangle whether the coalition formation amongst the SCs is across all kinds of SCs or within that dominant SC group? Yeah, that's a really good question. So for what I'm going to show you, I'm going to just combine all SCs, but absolutely, some of the jatis within SCs are definitely the ones who benefit. Um, the power is really tricky when we start trying to disentangle yeah, exactly, this, because exactly. SC is already a minority group, and then further splitting it apart yes. is really tricky. Um, the one thing we can do in that direction is go the other direction and ask, well, what about links to the, the jati, the subcast, that's not SC that has the lock on power? So there, you know, we know that, um, uh, certain communities are disproportionately likely to hold this, this office. And we're going to proxy, but, and, and, but the problem is we want to know, you know, are links to that specific dominant group the ones that are falling the most? Um, now, we can't see who would have been elected in the absence of reservation. So what we do instead is we proxy for this counterfactual by looking at the subcast um, of the Mukia in the previous election, pre-reservation. Okay, and what we're gonna do here is scale, we're gonna look at links to that one specific jati, um, scaled by the non-SC population. So this is directly, these coefficients are directly comparable to what I showed you before. Okay, 
So if we look across the board at all respondents, everybody's actually dropping their links to that, uh, to that politically powerful Jati. Um, both SCs, it's about 50% of the SC to non-SC effect and non-SCs. Um, and so this just suggests that both non-SCs and SCs alike realize that this group's less popular and they actually you know, do move on and they, 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 they're, they're, their social networks recenter. And this kind of pushes against a backlash kind of rationale because um, there shouldn't be backlash in, 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 these, in these groups. Um, and it is, but it, it's not 100% of the effect. It's only, it is, it's only 50% of the effect, but some of that is going on. Yeah. We also give in India the reservation to scheduled tribes. You have not examined that? So, this is so there's, also, there's also reservation for scheduled tribes. We had to kind of, you know, draw the, the um, a box around what we wanted to study more precisely, but absolutely one could study that. In the villages we went to in these blocks, um, this, the ST populations aren't that high, uh, but one could do something similar to this uh, with STs. We just needed to kind of limit the scope somewhere. Okay. Question? Yeah. Um, about this link rate, what is it like? This is not at an individual level, is this at the community level? I'm confused how like, it would change with N. Kind of like, is there, does that make sense? Like, so yeah, so this is, an, this is an individual level data set. Um, and it's saying, let's take the number of friends I have, and I'm just going to normalize it by my village population. So then the interpretation is not my degree. The interpretation is the percent of other people I'm linked to of various groups. So mechanically, though, the larger the village is, the smaller that, that measure is. No. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on um, how degree grows with N. We usually think it does, but maybe not like as fast. So you're right. So but I, I think another thing is that we, you know, we focused on villages that were reasonably similar in size, just because we wanted to get a reasonable fraction of respondents. So we don't have so much variation in village size. But you're right. You know, we could do the same thing in degree, and, and the results look very similar. Yeah. Interpretation we think was easier here, but you're right. We could we could easily do the same thing with, with just the regular degree. Okay. Especially because n isn't going to be it's orthogonal to the the algorithm. Um, okay, so what we so everything I've just shown you is that direct elicitation. So we do want to think about um, network level statistics. We have to figure out, you know, what's the right level, right network level statistic for our specific example. Um, and what we were drawn toward was homophily. Now we see that people are kind of circling their wagons. The SCs are linking more to SCs. They're breaking their links with non-SCs. So that seems to indicate that homophily is going up. Um, Golub and Jackson have a very nice theory paper thinking about the impacts of homophily on downstream outcomes. And they show that homophily makes it harder to learn, and it takes longer for a group to come to consensus in a degroup learning process. And so a, a village or a network with more homophily, um, uh, uh, this one's going to have high homophily. You have more um, within links, within group links versus cross group links here. You see there are more cross-group links uh, relative to this. Um, and this is sort of conservation of, of, of average of total number of links across these two. Okay. So we're going to take the measures that are predicted from um, the Golub and Jackson with like a pretty, you know, using our ARD data. Um, and we indeed show that this consensus time does go up. So the time to convergence in a treated versus a controlled place goes, uh, it, it takes nine times longer. And this is driven by the fact that, you know, people are, are, are more clustered into their own sub-communities. Yeah. There's a question on the overall welfare implications of homophily, right? So this is not clear in the sense that homophily might be good if the, the nature of the relationship, cross-group relationship was say, abusive absolutely. and it existed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I totally agree with you. And, and one thing I cut, um, there's some really interesting quotes you get from ethnographic studies talking for, for an SC to talk to a non-SC, there's like, the, this was a vivid quote, it's like holding an egg in your armpit. You know, it's costly, you have to be, yeah. you feel like you have to be on your best behavior. And so one interpretation of this is that affirmative action gives the disadvantaged group the privilege to not have to engage in those abusive exactly. relationships. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I absolutely agree with that interpretation. And I do think it makes welfare kind of tricky. And this ties into, I'm sorry, this ties into also things like residential segregation within a village for example. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think one, one really interesting paper that kind of echoes this is uh, one by Arkadev Ghosh, 
who thinks about um, cross-religious groups. And what's really um, compelling to me that I think fits into that narrative very nicely is that it's the Muslims that have to um, pay the cost of integration. They have to work harder. They have to give up their breaks. And you can imagine something like this is going on. So I totally agree with you. And I think that is our preferred interpretation. Although, you know, this does suggest there's a negative externality on learning. So it's, you know, you have to balance all of these yeah, effects. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty nuanced picture. I totally agree. It's not a clear cut answer. Okay. So what we asked then is, you know, we, we did phone surveys during COVID and we asked, do people, uh, does information flow? Um, are people more or less likely to know their ASHA worker? Are people, um, how about something that doesn't involve the MUKIA at all? Scholarships, these are, are, are disseminated through the schools. And we find in both cases, uh, reservation leads to less information about these, these things flowing through the network, um, uh, which is consistent with the increase in homophily. Okay, we do a whole host of other things to try to show that to, you know, for some of it's exploratory. We find no change in beliefs or stereotypes at all. We find no shifts in perceived norms. The, the UC, the, the non-SCs think that norms have improved. The SCs don't think things have changed at all. Um, and uh, CAS is less salient. It's less likely to come up as a topic in general conversations about jobs. Um, and in fact, the non-SCs actually think that the um, reserved politicians are actually working harder. So this doesn't really seem to be um, backlash driven. We think that it seems to be more driven by you know, people like, extracting themselves from these costly relationships when now they have a direct, ac direct access to resources. And the last thing I wanna say is, you know, the, we showed negative impacts on information flow, but consistent with the prior literature, we find that um, there's improvements when there's reservation switched on in how much of these uh, COVID social transfer policies get distributed in the village. And that has impacts for both SCs and non-SCs. Again, kind of pushing against a, um, a, a backlash story. Uh, if the SC Mukias have policy priorities to get these pro-poor policies out the door, then that's gonna help everybody who qualifies regardless of their, of their caste group. Okay, so I, I just have a few more minutes. Um, and so I do think that this is quite um, nuanced. Uh, and so, you know, one question is, you know, how, how might we guard against some of the negative impacts of homophily while not saddling the SCs with those extra integration costs? Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about, and I just need a couple minutes, is, is a, a direction where Arun and I are trying to push ARD to make it even more approachable. So we have another paper, which is um, theory, which is more kind of statistics at this point, but we think that it has broader relevance for, for people trying to go out and add network modules to their surveys. So um, this is the, the model we, that, that Golub and Jackson is based on. And we think this model actually has a lot of you know, nice, nice features. So what, the, what these, this class of models are, are stochastic block models. And the idea of these models is that there are certain communities, either observed or latent, in a, in a network. And um, there's differential linking rates within and across these different communities. And so the kind of thing you, that, that we want to now uh, measure are, are not individual level connections, which is very data greedy. But if we can even measure these community level connections, that might already teach us a lot. We did something like this in, our, in the CAST project, where CAST is clearly the community we're interested in. But we could do this more broadly, thinking about latent network structure, where we actually can't label the communities nearly as, as cleanly. And um, what we show in, in this paper, among other things, is that ARD uh, is very nicely accommodated into estimating these linking probabilities. Okay, so how, why, why might this have interesting empirical content? Well, at a broad level, we can ask, how is society divided along what kind of lines? Uh, what characteristics are most correlated with community membership? Um, and does an intervention work better in some parts of the network than others? And so um, the way that ARD is helpful uh, is that you can do the same type of data collection, ask these ARD traits. Um, and as long as this assumption holds, then, then, the, then the model kind of works. The assumption is that people with similar traits are going to play similar roles in the network. Um, meaning that these traits are going to be correlated in some sense with your likelihood of belonging to one community versus another, even if we can't see the community. Uh, and in this, it works better if the traits are mutually exclusive. Okay, so what, what the procedure does, and I think this is, this is nice, because in this kind of a world, you can 
you know, add this to maybe 15%, up 15% subsample in the village and still get interesting inferences about how the community is aligned. So what's going on kind of in the black box? Well, in the first pass, uh, we use an algorithm to detect what those latent communities are. And this is based on the distance in their ARD responses from one another. And so the algorithm is gonna say, let's look at uh, you know, people's responses and how, how linked they are to each of these different trait groups. How correlated are those two sets of responses? If they're correlated, if, if, the, if the difference between those two, uh, those two, if the distance between those responses is small, we're gonna just assign J to I. And if not, we're gonna assign them to a new community. We're gonna do that uh, for everybody in the village and that's gonna allow for, um, uh, we don't have to set the number of, of communities, we just have to set the threshold. Okay, once we have that, we can then estimate what's the probability of being in each of these communities that were just detected based on your ARD traits. And from there, we can estimate these linking probabilities across these latent communities. And I think this could be a really uh, e relatively simple way to bring some of these global network features into some survey data um, in a little bit more of a, a, a cost-effective way. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I do think networks can be very useful for analyzing a wide range of problems. Historically, the costs of getting this kind of data have been super high. And uh, so hopefully, um, some of these uh, new methods could be helpful for expanding the set of research. And I'm really uh, very happy to talk to anybody who wants to um, think about adding network stuff to their, their own surveys or RCTs.